Paul wrote to the Philippians. And finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We live in a world where we are bombarded by a whole bunch of ugly stuff, useless stuff, or things, that's mere, things that are merely practical and make us dull and gray and drab. We are bombarded by things that are opposite the true, the praiseworthy, the lovely. So we want to find some time and carve out some time to think about the lovely things and rejoice in the lovely things and let those be like like dropping a little bit of, of paint onto a black and white piece of paper and it's spreading and spreading and spreading and making it more vibrant and beautiful. Of course, this comes from the cross. It might be better to think of dropping a little bit of blood onto what was ugly and letting that soak through and spread and spread, filling what is drab and dead with what is living and life-giving. And so the beauty of the ugliness of the cross is something we want to find time for so that we can rejoice in, in the true things, the praiseworthy things, the excellent, the noble things, the lovely things, and the things that people think are useless usually, but are beyond useful because they're beautiful. One of the things that I've been reading recently is I've had this book for a long time, uh, the Introduction to Christian Worship by James White. Haven't gotten around to reading it until uh, this last week. And a lot of good stuff and some stuff I uh, disagree with. But one, one sentence was really striking and stuck with me. It's a two-word sentence. The time talks. James White, in his introduction to Christian worship, had a whole chapter on, on time. And he simply said, time talks. What does that mean, time talks? Well, what he's talking about there is the structure of a Christian church here. What does a congregation do throughout the year? What does the calendar look like? What does the daily life of a Christian look like? If we look at our schedule and there's no time for prayer, no time for hearing the word of God, if going to church to be with God's people and receive God's gifts, if that keeps getting put off or canceled, or maybe it'll be next week, well, time talks. Time talks, it shows where your heart is, what's important for you. Your schedule will reveal your heart because you will make time for what you love. So to examine your heart, one way of doing that is to examine your schedule. What are you making time for? What are you canceling? What are you putting off? And that can be a painful thing to take a look at one's own schedule. To really, because when you're examining what you do, you're examining this, your heart. And you're probably, if you're like me, are going to find a lot of misplaced time, misplaced effort. Time talks. I love that. It's nice and short, two T's. Uh, time talks, you can remember it, uh, but it also cuts to the heart. <laughs> what does my schedule say about what do I think is important? Am I spending too much time with work things and not enough time with family things? Am I spending too much? Am I spending enough time with kids but not enough time with my wife? Am I spending enough time in prayer and in 
meditating on God's word, not just reading it so that I can knock it off of the to-do list and say, yeah, I read the whole Bible this year, but I didn't really pay attention to any of it. How does time talk in your life? How does your schedule, what does your schedule reveal about your heart? We live in a free country. There's not too many people that are forcing you to make certain decisions with your own schedule. You probably can control your whole entire schedule. Now, other people are always involved. If you want to work in a particular job, and depending on how many other people are involved, that can impact your schedule. But you also can choose to no longer work in that job if it takes up time from your family, from being husband, father. You can decide to take less money and a less demanding job and to have a smaller house and to have more time in God's word, praying with your kids, going out on dates with your wife. You can choose how time will talk in your life. So I need to take a look at my own schedule, repent, make better use of my time, make more time for dates with my wife, more time for playing with my kids, more time for talking to, actually talking to members of our congregation, listening to them, praying with them. I need to reorder my time. And the summer is a great time for that for, for me. And summer might be a great time for, for that for you, for, for reworking the schedule. It's probably a good thing to do every year, to take a look at the, the weekly schedule. How am I spending my time? and to see, do I really want my heart to be like this? Because your schedule shows your heart. Do I really want my heart to be like this? Or do I want to fight against my old sinful nature? Do I want to pray the prayer of David in Psalm 51, creating me a new heart? And how can the schedule help to mold the heart so that it kind of goes can go both ways, I suppose, that your schedule will reveal your heart, but your schedule can also help to mold your heart. For if I break into the schedule some time where I'm in God's word, and that double-edged sword then gets to have its way with me and be like a surgeon's knife and fix this, then this can change and that can make it easier to improve the schedule in the future for the good of my soul, and for the good of my neighbors, and for their good. So I love that quote you know, from in James White in this book, Introduction to Christian Worship. A lot of good stuff in here, some not so great stuff. Um, some pictures too, I kind of love pictures. Uh, but that quote, time talks, uh, that one struck me this week and um, it's making me rethink my schedule. Now, here's a little book that I, I reread uh, earlier this year. I've read it, I don't know how many times. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful little book, again, filled with some stuff that's not so great, but enough really great stuff uh, that I keep coming back to it uh, to find some of that great stuff and be refreshed by it. it. Kathleen Norris is writing on the quotidian mysteries, laundry, liturgy, and uh, quote unquote, women's work. Uh, she's written elsewhere, uh, another book on what's called Acadia, which comes from a Greek word, Acadia. And it has to do with, the, the original Greek word had to do with not doing the good that you should do. So it was often used 
in Greek literature of failing to fulfill the funeral sacrifices and for a family member. So maybe your your unmarried sister dies and there's all of these things in the that culture that uh, a the, the nearest kin, the, the brother, uh, might have to do for uh, the, the funeral rites. And to not do that would be called Acadia. That word Acadia comes down to us as the word sloth, which we normally think of as just pure laziness, but it, it's, it's not doing the good that you should do. So it could be total laziness, got stuff to do and you just sit around, scroll through your phone, and eat Cheetos. That could be Acadia, sloth. It could also be, there's this good thing that I need to do, but I don't want to do it because it's difficult. And so I'm going to keep myself busy with volunteering at the food shelter over here and mowing the lawn and taking care of uh, all of these other good things. I'm going to keep myself busy so that I save myself from the pain of doing this good thing over here. Maybe, maybe I need to call my sister-in-law and bury the hatchet. And that's going to be a difficult conversation. And I hate that, and so I'm going to keep myself busy with all these other things. That also would be sloth or Acadia. Not doing the good that I need to do. Some of the good things that we need to do, we overlook. So when this demon of Acadia comes in uh, that keeps us from, from doing good things, that might keep us you know, lazy, in a sense, uh, where we're not doing uh, what, what we ought to do and we're just not doing anything good at all or anything useful. When, when the demon of Acadia uh, comes in and sets in, it, it often will be accompanied by what we often will talk about as depression in our day and age, that I can't get myself to do good things. So there's this nice paragraph and I wanted to read from Kathleen Norris. Our culture's ideal self, especially the accomplished professional self, rises above necessity, the humble, everyday, ordinary tasks that are best left to unskilled labor. The comfortable lies we tell ourselves regarding these little things and that they don't matter and that daily personal and household chores are of no significance to us spiritually are exposed as falsehoods when we consider that reluctance to care for the body is one of the first symptoms of extreme melancholia. Shampooing the hair, washing the body, brushing the teeth, drinking enough water, taking a daily vitamin, going for a walk, as simple as they seem, are acts of self-respect. They enhance one's ability to take pleasure in oneself and in the world. At its Greek root, the word Acadia means lack of care and indifference to one's welfare can escalate to overt acts of self-destruction, even suicide. So when Acadia comes in, depression often comes in too, and there's this lack of, of care. And so little things like shampooing your hair, brushing your teeth, making your bed, these are like bombs that are dropped on the demon Acadia to destroy him. He doesn't want you to care about what is good. That's what Acadia is. I don't really like the word sloth because it makes us think a little bit more just laziness and things like that. But it's this lack of care. That It's this giving up. And God gives us a wonderful blessing in our, our daily tasks, our, our work, like washing yourself, brushing your teeth, making your bed, doing the laundry. These are things that can destroy Acadia in us and remind us of what is good. That 
that you matter and the people around you matter and that little things are important. So the passage in Paul, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life work with your hands, to mind your own business, work with your hands. Do the little things. Make your bed. Brush your teeth. These are huge things because they remind you that of what is good. They remind you that you matter. God loves you. He loves your teeth. So floss them. I hate flossing. Um, but you need to floss them because God loves your teeth uh, and you're good and God loves you. He and you are good because he loves you, not because you brush your teeth. This is a wonderful thing in the uh, Heidelberg disputation at the end uh, that God, you know, mankind finds what is lovable and loves it because it's lovable, but God finds what is unlovable and through his love makes it lovable. You have been baptized into Christ, and so you have worth because God loves you, because God gives you your worth. And so, and so you can brush your teeth. You can drink water. You can get out and, and get some sun, and you can walk around. You can forget about yourself, and in that way, really start to take care of yourself. So doing those little things, it can be like a bomb dropped on Acadia and that lack of care and turn you outside of yourself to better take care of yourself and to better love your neighbor. This is the benefit of remembering your baptism every morning, remembering your worth that has been given to you as a gift in baptism as you've been united to Christ in his death and in his resurrection and have become a beloved child of the Heavenly Father. And therefore, you have worth. And your worth goes out from you to others and so that you can love them and serve them as well because you've been united to Christ who did everything for others, for us, for you. And that for you moves you outside of you for others. So Acadia turns you in on self and that you no longer care about the world around you, the people around you, and you no longer care about yourself and you can no longer move. It is, it's a paralyzing sort of thing. Depression's a paralyzing sort of thing. That's this Acadia stuff and the sloth stuff. But the cross, baptism, this gets you outside of yourself to receive love in the grace of God in Christ and pushes you outside of yourself to serve, to brush your teeth for the good of another, to make your bed for the good of another, to fold the laundry, mow the lawn for the good of another. It gets you outside of yourself and to start caring about life again. It gets you more in line than in that way with, with the way that God thinks. So in a couple of weeks here at church, we're going to read from Genesis chapter 1 on Trinity Sunday. And we'll hear this refrain day after day, and, and, and it was good, it was good, it was good. God made it, and it was good. God made it, and it was good, it was good. This is what God says about his world before the fall into sin. It's good. It's good. And we get to restore that, that goodness of creation, of people. After the fall into sin, everything gets broken, but we get to restore that as we focus on the cross of Christ, on the good of Good Friday. That's really the ultimate bomb that is dropped on Acadia. That God became man and died for you. He cares. And that care can motivate you to have this the care for life restored in you. Care enough to, to wash your hair. 
and brush your teeth. We don't always feel like doing those sort of things. They, they sometimes, if, if it seemed like it's, it's too menial, there's a little stuff that the uh, she talked about, you know, unskilled labor, uh, and we should have, uh, you know, less important people do this less important stuff. But doing that less, those little things, the, the less important stuff, turns everything uh, back uh, the, the way it ought to be like Jesus washing feet. That's unskilled labor. Get down on your knees and to scrub filthy feet. It should be beneath the Son of God, but it wasn't. And little things don't need to be beneath you. In fact, when you lower yourself to be like a servant, when you do the, the quiet things, in life. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. On your own business, work with your hands. When you consider yourself lower than others, like Paul talks about in Romans 12, that you consider others greater than yourself. You become a servant, like in Philippians 2. Then you really become great because you forget about yourself. You care for others. You become like Christ. All of that to say, remember your baptism in the morning and live it out. Oh, this great joy in the baptismal life of, of service and doing the little things. Wisdom is a gift from God. And we've been looking at, at Proverbs these last a couple of weeks and mentioned that the structure of Proverbs is, is kind of neat that at the beginning of of Proverbs, you have a fatherly advice that directs the son to lady wisdom and away from lady foolishness or folly. And lady folly is pictured like a conniving prostitute who wants to take advantage of the weak willed. In Proverbs in chapter 5, we hear the father warning the son uh, about the lady folly, this conniving prostitute. And now, O sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. And you say, how I hated discipline. My heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. So those, those last verses are the words of an old man who looks back on his foolish youth. He gave in to the, the prostitute, Lady Foolishness, Lady Folly, followed her ways. He was a fool, and he looks back with regret on that. It is a wise thing for young people to listen to the regrets of old people so that when those young people become old people, they don't have the same regrets. We live in a time when there's this like age segregation. You are, you go to school and you're with kids your age and you continue to go to school with kids your age. And then you hang out with young adults your age. And there's things for, there's groups for 30 year olds and groups for 40 somethings and, and on and on. We get segregated by age. And I think we miss so many blessings. And by having multi-generational contact, 20 somethings need to be listening to 80 somethings listening to what wisdom they have to offer and listening to their regrets. It's a, such a helpful thing 
to hear what someone in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s says, I wish I never. And to take that to heart when you're 15, when you're 25, when they say, I wish I never. Let that sink in so that you never, so that you're safe from those kinds of regrets. If you are a teenager, if you are 20 something, 30 something, if you're young, make it a habit to find someone who's old and ask them, what do you wish you would have done more of? What do you wish you never would have done? Do that today, find someone today, call them up. You gotta know somebody who's in their 80s who would absolutely love to have a random phone call from someone in their 20s. Just to check in, just to chat, and to ask a question like that. Like, what do you wish you never did when you were 20? What do you wish you would have done before you were 30? What are you glad that you did do before you turn 25? You won't regret it. If you're 20 something, call someone who's 70 something, 80 something, 90 something. They will love it because they're probably having kind of a tough day. They're probably feeling kind of lonely. So they will love it if you call them and you will benefit greatly if you do a whole lot of listening to them. Ask them for wisdom. Ask them for advice. I bet most of it will be good. Some of it might be bad, who knows? But probably most of it is gonna be solid gold. So this, this book of Proverbs, it starts off with the father giving sons wisdom. Uh, advice. And, and at the end of Proverbs, you also have a son who records the advice that his mother gave to him. This is something that it, if we're going to understand wisdom, we got to get this part right. We got to remember that this is key, that young people should be listening to older people. They're sinners too, and so sometimes they might be wrong. But if we listen to the wisdom of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. And so it's not like things have changed so drastically and people who are 70 year old, uh, years old right now know absolutely nothing and 20 somethings all of a sudden are the wise ones. If you're 20 something, call a 70 something year old, 80 something year old, a 90 something year old and say, hey, I'm just muddling along here. You got any advice? I wish I woulda, they'll get into all of those. I wish I woulda, I'm glad I did. And all of those things are things to soak in. Go call an old person and rely on their wisdom. So Proverbs, the wisdom of, uh, of God is in Proverbs includes that you know, listening to our elders, okay? Now, a life of prayer is a life that we're all called to as, as Christians. Uh, this book, Grace Upon Grace, The Spirituality for Today by John W. Kleinig. He's an Australian Lutheran uh, pastor, professor. His website is well worth your time. A lot of good, deeper sort of academic theology, a lot of... Uh, not academic theology, practical, good stuff, a lot of grace, a lot of grace upon grace, very useful things. You will find audio stuff, things to read, things to watch. Go to johnkleinig.com, amazing. Not just because it's always fun to hear an Australian accent, but because it is gospel-centered. It's good news. There's so much pointing to Christ and the cross. And this book is, is amazing. 
I need to reread the whole thing again one of these uh, months coming up. But I wanted to read a little bit of the end of his chapter on the mystery of prayer. He has six points at the end uh, where he's, he's talking about suggestions about the practice of intercession as advocacy for others. So we're to pray at all times, and one of the things that we are to pray for is for other people. That prayers and intercessions, the scriptures say, should be made for all men. We, we pray for ourselves, but we pray for all other people. So he gives some suggestions for how we do that. And I want to read just the, the first suggestion because I, I think this is a, a unique one. This was a striking one first time I came out, uh, across it. So I would like, therefore, uh, to end this section with some suggestions about the practice of intercession as advocacy for others. And they come from my own experience and our methods that have helped me in this difficult art. So the first one is this. The best place to begin is with congregational worship. There we stand in the presence of the triune God and are surrounded by all the saints. Unless I happen to be leading the service, I use four points in the service to pray for others. When I enter the building, before the service begins, I pray for the pastor, the musicians, the whole congregation, the visitors. I also make it a practice never to go to Holy Communion just for myself. I go with some specific request for myself, but I also go for help uh, for some other people whose needs I have discovered in the previous week. So I go to Communion, thinking about praying for another. I seldom sing the hymn during the distribution, but I pray for my brothers and sisters as they go forward to receive Christ's body and blood. So during communion, we often have distribution hymns. Sometimes in our church, we have a choir or just some instrumental music. On those Sundays, when we do that in our church, those are probably a good time to think and pray for everyone that you see. Pray specifically for them. Don't think about why do they wear their hair like that or why are they wearing that uh, tie? What, how, you know. Don't think the way the sinful nature wants to think. Look at someone, pray for them. And praying for them in connection with as they're receiving the Lord's body and blood. What a great time to be praying for people. Also, so he says, I seldom sing the hymn during the distribution, but pray for my brothers and sisters as they go forward to receive Christ's body and blood. If I notice that someone seems especially troubled, I concentrate for a while on that person. And then lastly, I take any subjective and objective distractions during the service as directives to pray for the people involved. So, distractions. Um, I think that... The, the noise of children, toys falling in the back pew, in the front pew, uh, children uh, talking with each other louder, or maybe having a, a disagreement uh, with mom in the pew. Some people will think about that, well, what a terrible distraction. Why can't they just make their kids be quiet? It's a welcome noise. I want to hear kids in church. I want to hear that noise. I want to hear toys falling. I want to hear kids in church. When you hear some kind of distraction, even if it's you know, a bird running into the window or construction uh, going on across the street, anything like that, this old sinful nature wants to use that as a chance to grumble. The new man uses that as a chance to pray and glorify God. It's a chance for gratitude. So if you find yourself complaining, Instead of praying, know that it's the sinful nature and try to nip it in the bud. As Christians, we are baptized into Christ and the old sinful nature is only good for drowning. If you find your heart grumbling about the noise of little children in church, take that grumbling voice and grab it by the throat and put it under the waters of baptism. Don't listen to it. Don't give voice to it. Don't give a young mother or father the evil eye. Let that be damned, because that's from the old sinful nature. If you hear 
the noise of children in church, glorify God. Be grateful that you hear that and pray for those little children, not that they would learn to be quiet. Pray for those little children that they would learn that this is their house. This is the Lord's house. This is where they belong. Pray for that mother and father that they're not overwhelmed with embarrassment because of the, the noise of their children. Don't try to fix them so that there's quiet. Be grateful for them and pray for them. So I loved, uh, I love uh, these, these four things. So as he, as he goes in, as he goes to communion, he's praying not only for himself, uh, but for someone else. So it, it seems like he's thinking about preparing that beforehand. Like, who am I going to bring with me in prayer to the Lord's altar? So thinking about someone, that is a good time for thinking about people that, that are not going to be coming with you physically to the Lord's table. Maybe it's a, a shut-in of the congregation, someone who's sick in the hospital in your congregation, someone who doesn't belong to the congregation, someone who's not within the Christian church at all and out in the darkness. It's a good time, it, maybe, not, maybe not every Sunday, but it's a good time to bring someone who doesn't, who's not, who's not going to be shoulder to shoulder with you at the communion rail, but to bring them in, in your heart, to pray about them up there. And all of the things that you, all the people you could be praying for, all of the sins that you could be mindful of in your own heart and rejoicing the forgiveness of your sins as you're there at the Holy Communion, there's never enough time. The pastor should slow down a little more, take his time, so that you can take your time. This is not something to rush through, it's something to slowly pray your way through and enjoy and be grateful in this wonderful meal of, of Thanksgiving. So, so again, the four, the four things, it, when he enters the church, when he goes up to communion, when others are going up to communion, he says he seldom sings the distribution hymn and so it, maybe you love to sing the distribution hymn, and so maybe you don't bother with that one. But maybe you also take a verse off. You know, just skip skip the odd verses, maybe, you know, when you're sitting in the pew after you've communed, and only sing the even verses, and during the odd verses, think about the people who are going up. So that's the third, He's as other people are going up. And then the fourth one, this is wonderful. Whenever there's any kind of quote-unquote distraction, construction across the street. Make that a reason for prayer. Pray for the safety of the construction workers rather than grumbling about how they're doing, making so much noise during your church service. <laughs> uh, any kind of distraction, let it be not an opportunity for grumbling, an opportunity for gratitude, and something that sparks a life of prayer. Thinking about that that if we are to pray without ceasing, if we are to be constantly giving thanksgiving, there's really no time for grumbling left. Every opportunity that the old man takes to grumble is an opportunity that the new man can take for gratitude and for prayer. So that was from the last uh, the end of the chapter on the mystery of prayer from this amazing book, Grace Upon Grace, Spirituality for Today, John W. Kleinig, worth having on your shelf. It takes a little while to, to get through. If you want to borrow my copy, um, I'm here in Garrisonville. Uh, you can maybe borrow it, but uh, it's, a, it's a book I've given away a number of times and bought a number of times uh, because it's so good. People uh, want to keep it, and I love that. But uh, Grace Upon Grace, John Kleinig, amazing book. Fatherhood. Fatherhood is under attack. And not only by those who hate fathers, but fatherhood is also probably the most vicious attack. It comes from people who are trying 
to be good fathers, but they're doing it with, with a law mindset. So there are two words from Holy Scripture. There's, there's the law and there's the gospel. The law shows our sin. The gospel shows our Savior. The law, as Paul says in Galatians 3, is, is given to reveal transgressions. The gospel gives comfort. Jesus has died for all of your sins. You have been baptized into Christ. You're covered. You're, you're named as God's own child. There's comfort in the gospel. There's hope in the gospel. There's no comfort. There's no hope in the law. The law shows our sin. And so if, if we approach fatherhood from a law-dominant mindset, then we will not take up, then we will fail to be the kind of fathers that the scriptures say we ought to be. And so fathers do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That training and instruction of the Lord does include the law, but it has the gospel, the comfort as the dominant thing, that the law always gives way to and leads to the gospel. When the law is the dominant thing, you will exasperate your children. A book that talks about being dad uh, in a way that is gospel dominated is this book called Being Dad, the Fathers as a Picture of God's Grace. It's by Scott Keith, a beautiful book, read it a number of times. I uh, want to read it again. Uh, one of the quotes I want to take a look at is where Scott Keith is quoting uh, someone else, uh, Gustav Wingren, uh, who has written some amazing books as well. But here he, he talks about law and gospel. I want to get this right because this is key to fatherhood that does not exasperate children, but allows them to grow, flourish, to be brought up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It has to be gospel dominated, not law dominated. So Wingren said, and this is Scott Keith and being dad quoting Gustav Wingren, the gospel always breaks into a world that has already got law and for which law is not news, not a novelty. And then Scott Keith continues, it, it is the gospel that goes against the norm. It is the gospel that is a novelty. It is the gospel that is not only news, as Wingren says, but good news. As Martin Luther so eloquently so eloquently phrased the paradox of the gospel in his great Galatians commentary, the gospel supplies the world with the salvation of Jesus Christ, peace of conscience, and every blessing. Just for that, the world abhors the gospel. So Wingren is saying that when the gospel comes in, it's coming into a world that doesn't have it, a world that already has the law. We have the law written on our hearts. We have consciences, whether we've ever heard of Jesus or not. We know the law, and we know what we ought to do. And so fathers need to know that, that law stuff is stuff that their kids kind of already have and don't really need to be taught. There's some teaching that needs to happen. There's some correction when it comes to the law and and what is right and wrong. But if you never said anything about how it's wrong to steal someone else's toy, your child will know that when someone steals their toy. They've got that written in their heart. They know stealing is wrong. And they know if they have stolen someone else's toy and mom sees it, the guilt is going to come. So they've already got the law. What they don't have by nature is this peace of conscience that comes from the gospel and knowing that Christ has forgiven them. He has paid for their sins. Their bap the, the gift of baptism washes away all of their sins and so that by grace they are God's children, not by work, not by law. So as, as Christian fathers, we want to have the gospel dominate. So there's time for talking the law. 
but we always wanted to give way to the gospel so that the, the love of God in Christ Jesus on the cross and the gift of baptism, especially in connection with fatherhood, that this is the dominant thing. This is the overall thing. This is the thing and the thing alone that's going to give your kids peace of conscience, not their behavior. If, if we father our children in a way that they're always looking to their behavior for comfort with their conscience, it'll be back and forth, back and forth. They will be at one moment prideful little Pharisees who are arrogant because they've been good little boys and girls and at the next moment hate themselves so much that they want to give up. Get them off of that swing set and sitting on the solid ground of the rock of Christ, the gospel. You have a clean conscience because you have been baptized into Christ. Fathers, you have a clean conscience for all your failures as a father because you've been baptized into Christ. And you get to tell your kids the same. And that's a strange thing. The law is not a strange thing. Do what is right, don't do what is wrong. Uh, all of that, be good, be good, be good. All of that, the world is just full of it. And when the world is trying to find their hope and their peace of conscience in it, they are despairing on one day and on the other day, they are prideful, arrogant fools who are looking down on everyone else. Get your kids off of that swing set and into the font. And they can rejoice that in Christ, they are God's beloved children and they are your beloved children. Don't let them ever think that your love for them depends on their behavior. So that they never think that God's love for them depends on their behavior. It all depends on the love of God in Christ Jesus at the cross and in the font. They've been baptized into Christ and so they can have peace of conscience. This is, a, this is just an amazing book, uh, Being Dad. You know, the weeks ahead, I hope to find more and more quotes uh, to share with you about uh, being dad and some good chapters on the art of the lost art of masculinity. That'll be a fun chapter. I want to take a look at, at this. It's filled with a lot of great stories about fathers being a good picture of God's grace. And fathers not being law dominant, but gospel dominant. So, amazing book, Being Dad by Scott Keith. Look forward to sharing some of the good things in that book with you. I pray that God give you peace and joy and an eye towards the things that are lovely in this world. There's so much that is ugly and we can just grumble and complain and be lost and give up hope. But there's lovely things. And the most lovely thing is the ugliness of the cross. Jesus loves you. And in him, you have peace of conscience and you have hope for everlasting life. God's peace be with you.